Good evening and welcome to the NCNW WEW broadcast webinar. My apologies, we were having some technical difficulties. I am Director of Communications Kevin Johannes here with the National Council of Negro Women, and thank you for joining us tonight. Tonight we have a special program because we are actually working together with the National Coalition of 100 Black Women, and we have two special guests, so they're going to give us a lot of information about fraud and what's been going on during the pandemic times. However, I am not going to be your host. One of our veteran webinar participants and guests, Ms. Camille Simpkins is going to be your host, and you will hear from her via telephone as we, as I said, we had some technical difficulties. So Ms. Simpkins, take it away. Thank you so much, you so and much. thank you so much for your patience. I um, am having some technical difficulties, so I can't be there with you live, but I'm glad to be here. Now, generally, when I'm with um, you and I'm engaging the National Council of Negro Women, I'm usually just me and them. And then at other times, I'm with the National Coalition of 100 Black Women, but today, I'm with you both. So thank you so much. And again, I appreciate your patience. What's interesting about the space that we're in right now, and I don't know if you guys have realized it, but it's the power of the peace. So for me, um, as a business development officer with Wells Fargo, it first started with the pandemic, of course, and then it started with the payroll protection program loan. And I don't know how many of you have heard the word pivot. Quite often, right? Because you've had to pivot your business in the midst of the pandemic. Other keys that come to mind um, are power, purpose, and potential. Well, tonight, the presentation is going to be sponsored by Prevention and Partnership. The partnership between the National Council of Negro Women and the National Coalition of 100 Black Women. And within that partnership, we have two amazing guest speakers. First, another P, is the president and CEO of Identity Theft Resource Center, Eva Velasquez. She previously served as the vice president of operations for the San Diego Better Business Bureau and spent 21 years at the San Diego District Attorney's Office. When you talk about power, she is recognized as a nationwide expert and has been featured on such outlets as CNBC, Huffington, Post Live, Forbes, Bloomberg, Kiplinger's, and numerous other outlets. Eva is the driving force for behind the first free identity theft help app and the ITRC's new artificial intelligence victim shop bot. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Am I, Eva? Vivian. Vivian. <laughs> Vivian is currently in a beta testing mode and she's going to be released this year. But Eva is a published author and regularly invited to speak at events nationwide, such as tonight. So she is going to share her wealth of experience relative to um, theft protection and fraud. Now, I also want to bring another partner to the stage tonight, Andy Collins. He has 35 years of banking background with experience ranging across the retail enterprise, regional management, project management, and yes, fraud operations. Andy is the Senior Vice President of Industry Insights and Intelligence. We feel like we're in an episode of Law and Order Organized Crime. Right? <laughs> Andy has directed the end-to-end -end product growth on $65 billion deposit portfolio. Now that's where the fraud usually takes place, at the top of the house. He's managed a countrywide network overseas with military banking facilities, and he's led an end-to-end -end fraud operation with over 400 employees. Now, his role currently is within our Fraud and Claims Management Department. So when I tell you that there is a partnership brewing tonight, 
relative to prevention. We're going to talk through the types of identity theft and crimes. You're going to hear some case studies on common attacks. You're going to hear about protecting your identity and resources for you as a victim, as a consumer, and or a business owner. So again, I wanted to be there live with you tonight, but I am here on the sidelines. And I am going to turn it over to both Andy and Eva. But I am so honored to be here with both of my favorite organizations. So I am going to give it to you, Andy, to start us off. And in because I'm a gentleman, I'm going to hand it off directly to Eva, who's going to give us the bulk of the uh, the presentation tonight, and I'll follow her, which is always an appropriate place for me. And well, I thank you very much. Ladies first. Share my screen here and make sure I'm doing this properly. So I do need a, a technology check. Can you see my screen with the appropriate slides? That is correct. All right. Well, one, one part of our technology um, is functioning properly. That is the good news. I am so pleased to be here. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. You really make me sound um, I think a lot more important than I am, but the information that I'm going to share is super important. Uh, fraud and identity theft in the era of, of COVID-19. Now, a lot of these pieces really are applicable um, even pre-pandemic, but we've had some special circumstances and a lot of new trends that are emerging, and I'm going to share those with you tonight. And there we go, now it's working. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Identity Theft Resource Center, I'd just like to acquaint you really quickly. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization established to empower and guide consumers, victims, businesses, and government to minimize risk and mitigate the impact of identity compromise and crime. And when I say identity crimes and compromise, that's very broad. It includes identity theft and fraud, but also things like data breaches, cyber crimes and scams and fraud. And we try to tackle this issue really holistically because we engage in efforts that, that reduce the overall victimization rate. I would consider this presentation one of those efforts because we're educating folks, but we also um, have, a, have direct one-on-one -on -one victim services. So if the worst does happen, if you do find that you are um, a victim of identity theft or fraud, or even if you have questions and something has come across your radar and you, and you don't quite know how to handle it, we have live advisors that will help you through a toll-free hotline number, through live chat on our website, even uh, text to chat, email, postal mail. Um, you can uh, direct message us on social media. However you want to engage with us, we, we're happy to talk to you that way and we will walk you through the recovery process um, for the entire length of time that it takes for you to restore your identity. These are the, the highlights of what we're going to talk about today, and uh, I won't read them all. I just do want you to understand that there's a process we're going to go through, and I'm going to build some foundational um, uh, education here so that you really, that we have a common frame of reference about what we're talking about. And I promise, I promise, I promise that I will get to the how to protect yourself. It comes a little bit further in the presentation, but I promise I'll get there and you're gonna walk away with some great um, information and great tips. So let's start, what, you know, what am I talking about when it comes to identity theft and fraud? Let's just start with some of the basics. Um, there are really four main types that we categorize, financial, medical, criminal, and government. Financial is just what it sounds like. Um, a, someone other than you has opened up financial accounts in your name. Maybe it's a getting an auto loan or a credit card, opening a bank account, even a, a home mortgage. Uh, medical identity theft is where someone has uh, gotten medical goods or services in your name. And it can be anything from a, you know, a doctor's appointment to hospital stays or surgery. It can even be for prescriptions or durable medical equipment, you know, things like crutches and, uh, you know, or a wheelchair, that type of thing. And then criminal identity theft is where someone has used your identity and given it to law enforcement during the commission of a crime. 
And it can be anything from a, a moving violation, you know, like a, a speeding ticket or something like that, all the way up to a felony violation. And then government identity theft. And this is really right now currently the, the biggest issue that we're having today. And that's where someone uses your identity credentials to get government benefits or services. Right now, unemployment benefits, identity theft is, is has really ballooned and skyrocketed. And I will talk a, a little bit more about that. Personally identifiable information. Maybe you even heard the term PII. You know, what is it? These are your identity credentials. These are these tokens that actually make up your identity and your digital identity. Things like your social security number, your birth certificate, um, even financial accounts. And I'm going to include username and password as these credentials. So oftentimes we don't think of that, but it, it really is one of the important credentials. And then we have attributes. And these are, you know, your name, your phone number, your license plate, your date of birth. And if I had to separate these two out and, and kind of tell you how to categorize these in your mind, I would encourage you to really think about the credentials as the things that you don't want to overshare, that you want to be very judicious about who you give that information to or provide that true. And as the attributes, really, that's not something I want you to worry about. Don't worry, your license plate is public. The, you know, your phone number, really, it's, it's most likely um, out there and while some damage can be done if these have your phone number, I just really don't want you to worry about those things. I'd much rather that you focus on your identity credentials. But also let's talk about some other identity data. This is really important information and believe me, it's out there about you. Biometrics are being used every day. I mean, really, Apple normalized the use of uh, fingerprint and facial recognition just to unlock our phones. But it's more than just that. It, I mean, facial, uh, not just facial recognition, but your, the, the voice print, your ear print, um, all these things are unique to you. And they are being either used or they're developing use cases to use these as identifiers. And the one that we really don't think about are behaviors. Um, your behaviors or, or biometric behaviors, uh, these things are being captured, particularly if you're very active digitally and active online. Um, your spending habits, where, where you shop, how much you spend, um, how long do you keep items in your cart, how do you pay for them, all of that is actually being tracked and measured. Now, before you get uh, deeply offended and say, how can this be happening and how can they do that to me? I do want to let you know that there are some really legitimate use cases for capturing that information and fraud detection is one of them. Uh, it, if you've ever received a call uh, from your bank or your credit card company saying, hey, did, is this you? Did you just try to buy uh, a, a big screen TV in, in Arkansas or were you just in Buffalo, New York putting gas in your car? And you say, no, that that wasn't me. Um, someone else is using my, my payment card, my debit card, or my credit card. One of the ways that they're able to flag those transactions is because they're anomalous and they know this is outside of the normal spending habits, normal purchasing habits. And so it can be very useful information, but just know that that information is being uh, tracked and it is being used in a lot of ways to uh, verify your identity and in some circumstances to authenticate your identity. So let's talk about a few of the current trends. I kind of alluded to the unemployment identity theft trend, and I'm willing to bet because of the, statistically speaking, half of the people listening to this webinar right now have probably been touched by this crime. They have probably uh, received some kind of notification about it. But it's not the only identity crime that's happening. Um, look, fraud is just way up. You can see this is data from the Federal Trade Commission. Um, and identity theft is up, general fraud is up. But when I look at these numbers and compare them, 29% of all fraud reported to the Federal Trade Commission was identity related. This is, it has always been a huge problem. You can see by the numbers on this graph. But really, this is the time now. I'm so glad you're here to learn this information because it really is skyrocketing and identity-related crimes are very lucrative for the thieves. 
I'll just quickly go over this slide. This our data tracks with the FTC's data. We saw huge increases in the demand for our services, and you can see this number. We saw a 4,800% increase in unemployment identity fraud. Now, this is where a thief has taken your known identity credentials and, and applied for and received unemployment benefits in your name. And this could be in any state, even a state you don't reside in. And because of the infrastructure, because of the state of data breaches, they've been so ubiquitous for the last 15 years, um, the thieves have the credentials and they were able to infiltrate those systems. To date, um, it, the, the lost dollars have been measured at about 63 billion, that's billion with a B, but based on what we're seeing and, and the trends that we're seeing, we know it's going to be uh, well over 100 billion and probably somewhere between 100 and 200 billion dollars that have been taken by thieves and are you know taken out of our economy just by this one type of identity theft um, i just talked about data breaches this is some data from our data breach report at the itrc we have been capturing <clears throat> excuse me, we have been capturing uh, information on date, publicly reported data breaches since 2005. And the reason this is important in the identity theft space is because this is what often leads to the identity fraud being committed. This is what the, the thieves use. Your PII, those credentials that I was just listing and talking about, all too often they are compromised in data breaches. So that's no fault of, of your own. You, you often have to share this information with legitimate companies, with the government. And if they don't safeguard that data and it's compromised, it can then be misused. So we've been tracking this information. And even though it shows that the breaches were trending down, you see that, that number at the end, we're 1108, um, that's, there's a reason for that. And we believe it was because frankly, the thieves were not taking the time to gather new data, to commit new uh, attacks against databases and scoop up these large swaths of consumer data because they were too busy leveraging the data they already had. They were too busy going into the unemployment systems, going uh, through the other pandemic relief programs to uh, apply for those benefits in the names of other people with all of those compromised credentials. We are seeing an uptick now in these first couple of quarters this year because they needed a data refresh, but that's why it is important to kind of understand what data breaches are and what's happening in that space because it's your data. This is your information that's being compromised. And now we'll talk about some of the common attacks and how you can spot them. Um, I know you probably uh, were a little bit tired of getting that foundational information, but now we're, we're going to get into what, what's going on with the scammers. Um, and I really want to do a deep dive into phishing and business email compromise. For those of you that haven't heard of this, this is where the scammers actually try to uh, get you to engage with them through um, attempts that either pretend to be someone that you know or a business that you trust, maybe a government agency, um, and, and they will send you an email, a text. It can come up, you know, it can be a message on, on your social media account, and they try to get you to engage. And most of the time, they want you to either download a document or click on a link so that they can infect your computer or so that you can think you're going to the legitimate organization. It'll, it'll look like, oh, I got this notice from my bank saying I need to change my password. And you, you click on the link and it looks like your bank's website, but those can be very, very easily faked. And so you enter in your username and password and your credentials, and you've now self-compromised them and given them to a scam scammer. So that's what phishing looks like, or that's the, the definition of it and, and what it looks like in real life. But here are some real life examples. And I'm sharing these because these, these actually come, came into us. Um, this is some screenshots that my COO took just because he got so many of them in, in just a few days. It was Amazon three ways. Um, so 
Why Amazon? Because so many people have Amazon accounts and you have a business relationship with them. Um, it, it, so it lends credibility and, and trust. You might automatically think this is legitimate because you have an account with Amazon or you just know who they are. And it's, it's very common to get these. Um, some of them are not that sophisticated, so they're easier to spot. Um, but make sure you read the actual headers in the email, the actual return email addresses. Um, and unfortunately, it looks like when the, we did the conversion, we can't see these highlights actually have these gobbledygook email addresses. They're not Amazon email addresses. They, they have, some of them have dot, um, uh, RU, which is Russia, um, on the end of the email, and so you can tell it's coming from a foreign country. Um, you know, no reply at XYZ, at Gmail, or at Yahoo. Amazon is not going to be sending you emails from a Gmail or a Yahoo account. Uh, so that's a really strong indicator. And what are they asking to do? Look at this. They're saying log in, confirm your identity. Oh, they make it sound like they're keeping you safe. Confirm your identity. And what you have to think of is, no, 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 I am not giving you my username and password. Username and passwords are extremely valuable. They're more, actually more valuable right now than your social security number. A, a Gmail username and password goes for about $155 on the dark web currently, whereas social security numbers are, are ridiculously low, something like $5. And, and credit cards are about $25 on the dark web. And, Look, I don't want to give you a false sense of security here that just by looking at these emails and, oh, I can spot a phishing email and I would never fall for that. Um, these are really, uh, these are super easy ones to spot. So these are, and that's the example that I'm showing you. But some of them are really sophisticated and they're not easy to detect. So the best rule of thumb here is if you did not initiate the contact, don't engage. Go directly to the source. And again, we'll use Amazon. So if you have this incoming communication that says, hey, we need you to log into your account, you don't need to click on the links in that email or that text message. Go to, however you engage with Amazon, maybe if it's on your desktop, maybe it's through the app, go and engage with them in that manner. And then you can look and see if there's messages in the customer service center or if there's something wrong with your account. Uh, so if you are not absolutely certain that you know who you're talking to, don't engage in that platform and go back to the source. All right, enough about phishing. Let, let's, let's dive into some scams here. So we'll talk about romance scams, phone scams, grandparent scams, and prize scams. Um, look, there are some common attributes to all scams. Um, and remember this, it's, it's trust, confusion, and urgency. They'll use trust, whether it's a brand you know, a government agency you know, um, it could even be a friend, uh, you know, spoofing a, a social media account to look like it's one of your contacts. And then they use confusion. They muddy the waters. If a process or external events are confusing, um, they'll they'll use that and and the sense of urgency. So the, very recently, um, it, it can be for some of the, what would appear to be such an innocuous thing, but. Um, very recently, the FTC took down a fraud ring that had 26 websites selling um, Clorox and Lysol and disinfectant type cleaning products. Now, who would have thought that cleaning products would be a lucrative scam? But because of the external events of last year, um, these scammers, they leveraged that sense of urgency they, and they leveraged the trust of brand names like Clorox and Lysol. And they were able to collect tons of uh, information about consumers, their name, their mailing address, the products they wanted, and then of course, most critically, their payment information, whether it was a debit card, a credit card, um, it even there, it had to be done online. So it was debit and credit cards. But I think that sense of urgency of, I need these cleaning products now um, was what made this such a lucrative scam for them. And sometimes it's not, the sense of urgency can be more, more threatening. It can be like consequences that you're going to suffer. Sometimes it's, uh, if you don't act now, you'll be arrested. 
or if you don't act now, uh, you know, this is the IRS and, and we're going to hit you with a bunch of penalties. Um, and by the way, scammers use this tactic because it works. That urgency creates fear. And when you're in that emotional state, um, it's not a good state for making decisions. So let's, let's break these down just a little bit. Romance scams, this is where scammers set up fake dating profiles, sometimes using public pictures um, and sometimes uh, looking like semi-prominent figures. They, they do it not just in dating websites, but also via social media or even email. And they form relationships very quickly. They, almost, they often respond almost immediately as if they're always online and available, which they are. Um, and in very short order, they are doing two things. They're professing their undying love. They build this relationship super quickly. And then of course they ask for money. And it's usually, uh, there's a great story behind it. Uh, I'm, uh, will you buy me a plane ticket so I can come and see you in real life? Um, I've had an unexpected business event, but I'm doing this huge investment. And if it comes through, I'll have all the money to take care of you. And when we talk about it here in this kind of engagement, you may think, how could anybody ever believe that? But trust me, it happens. And they're very good. These scammers are very good at what they do. And we have talked to people that have lost tens, even hundreds of thousands of dollars to, to these would-be suitors, these people that they thought they had a relationship with. So not only are they out that money, they're very emotionally traumatized because they felt like they had a relationship with that person. And general phone scams, this is where callers will pretend to know you or pose as a, a, a trusted entity. It can be a charity, uh, a bank, retailers, government agencies. Um, at the end of the day, they're just trying to get you to part with your money, often in the form of gift cards, or your data, or both. Um, and often they will use tactics where they have some information about you. And they're calling and going, well, are the last four digits of your social security number X, Y, Z? And they may have that information, maybe from a past data breach. And then they'll ask you to confirm the rest of it. Please don't do that. Don't engage because you don't actually know who you're talking to. Go back to the source. And the, the grandparent scam, um, this has been around for a long time, but it is still happening and still working. And this is where uh, callers or emailers usually calls pretend to be a relative needing, um, needing help. They're in some kind of financial distress. Uh, maybe they're traveling um, and they lost their documents or they say they were robbed or in an accident. Um, and they, it, in the case of the, the grandchild and grandparent relationship, they always say, don't get the family involved. Don't call mom and dad. And our advice is if you do have a grandchild or it's a family member, call the family member and verify first. And I think one of the reasons that this is um, we're seeing an uptick is because technology is affording even more opportunities to these scammers with things like deep fake audio. We actually had a call into the call center with someone who, um, a, an elderly couple who received a, a ransom, basically a kidnap ransom call saying that their daughter had been kidnapped. And they swore, they said her, it was her voice on the phone it was absolutely her voice on the phone. Thankfully, one of the parents decided to call the daughter's number and she was like, no, I'm at the day spa. What are you talking about? I'm fine. Um, it turns out that this, the, the daughter had a podcast. They were able to pull the audio off the internet and then deep fake her voice. So technology is really make, creating even more opportunities for some of these scams. And the last one I'll talk about here is the prize and grant scam. And this is, you know, congratulations, you won the lottery. Um, now you just need to pay the taxes up front. Well, I promise you that if you win the lottery, that the taxes are taken out of the winnings. You don't have to pay them up front. Um, and by the way, did you buy a ticket? You know, that's what I also say about sweepstakes and lotteries and things like that. If you didn't enter, how did you win? And I realize that right now, there is, there's, we have a challenge with that because with some of these uh, statewide vaccination lotteries, we are seeing a situation where you didn't have to enter. You just had to go get vaccinated. But that is the one exception to the rule, okay? For the most part, if you didn't enter, you're not going to win uh, the grand prize or the sweepstakes. And 
at long last, I told you I, we would talk about how to protect your identity. And now that we have that foundational information, uh, I think we're good to go. So this is a little bit of a refresh. Just don't provide your information unless you initiated the contact. So if that is the communication is incoming by email, by phone, by text message, by social media, if you didn't initiate it, be very wary. You don't actually know who you're talking to. Um, hanging up on automated calls, better yet, don't even answer them. If, if it's from a number you don't recognize on your phone, there's, there's no need to answer that call. Um, depositing money, if you get a check and, uh, and deposit it, oftentimes you'll get something saying, oh, can you, can you now wire the money back? Believe me, it's, it's a forged check and you don't want anything to do with that. Scammers love to ask for you to make payments with prepaid cards or gift cards because you can't claw that money back. You don't have the same protections on those as you do on your own credit card. So we always encourage people, if you are being told that the only way to pay for something or you're getting a demand that you pay a, a debt or a bill uh, with prepaid gift cards, run away. That's definitely a scam. And even if you get that call and it says it's coming from a government agency or, or you know, the IRS or even a friend, till you verify that that's the case, um, don't just believe caller ID. It's so easy to spoof now at this point. It's really worthless. It, it doesn't help all that much. So what else can you do about it? Please upgrade your password. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have such, we are such creatures of habit. We love to use the same password and the same easy password over all of the accounts that we have. And the scammers love that because once that information is compromised on one account, they know that you may be using that across multiple accounts. So please use a unique password on all of your different accounts. Don't use the same one. Um, and it doesn't have to be, it, it doesn't have to be the gobbledygook, the things that don't make any sense. Pick a, a passphrase. Um, maybe it's a line from a poem or a favorite um, music album or something like that. And then just 12 characters or longer because those take much longer to crack. Uh, you know, passwords that are easy passwords that are five, six, seven characters long, they can be cracked in less than a second. And this is another layer, multi-factor authentication. This is a great way to add that layer of protection for yourself. And it's widely available. Um, people just don't use it because they don't know that they can or they don't know that it's being offered by the particular organization or entity that they're they're engaging with. For those of you that don't know, multi-factor authentication is where when you are logging into an online account and you enter your username and password, you have to do one more step, and that's that you have to enter this code. And it can come to you on your phone. You can get it as, as a text message on your phone. It can come in email. There are even um, apps that you can download. That's what we at the ITRC use, where you just click the app and it's like, okay, that's really you. You have control of this phone. The, the challenge with MFA is that um, it's not mandatory most of the time, but it's available. So turn it on. If it's an option with your different accounts, go ahead and turn it on. It only takes a couple of seconds. It's really seamless and it is that extra layer of protection. And believe me, it takes a lot less time to go through that extra step of authenticating yourself than it does to remediate an identity theft case. I just want to remind people that um, protecting your device is critically important. It's not just your computer. We need to think of our phones like the computers that they are, and even our, our tablets as well. So put antivirus software on all of your devices, not just your computer. And please apply software patches and updates immediately. This is one where we get in the, oh, they, Apple's come out with a new update or your, your, um, you know, Microsoft is saying they have patches and you put it off. That is really, it's so critical because those are known vulnerabilities within the software. So when those companies issue the updates or the patches, they're addressing problems that they know are vulnerabilities that the hackers and bad actors want to exploit. And then it becomes a race. When they issue that patch, now the hackers also know what all the vulnerabilities are. 
So don't be the low hanging fruit. Just, you know, apply your software patches and updates right away. Just take the time to do it. And then when it comes to social media, look, we don't discourage people from using social media. We, there's a lot of data out there about you. We just say, please, you know, be thoughtful and safe about it. Be thoughtful with what you post. If you wouldn't put it on a billboard in front of your house, um, maybe not post it on your social media account. And when you're looking at all those different quizzes and questions, just realize that that's that's a they're hoovering up data about you when you engage in those so how important is it that you know what your spirit animal is you know according to facebook uh, just realize that you're creating more of that data and they are collecting it and mining it and again i go back to don't reuse usernames and passwords across all of your accounts have unique ones across all of your accounts including all of your social media accounts and then in real life, I've talked a lot about the digital ecosystem and certainly this is where a lot of these events and, and crimes are occurring, but it also happens uh, in analog style in real life. So these are just a couple of tips, you know, securing your personal doc documents, if possible, use a mailbox with a lock, that's not possible for everyone. And in the don't carry um, these important credentials in your wallet. You don't need to carry your social security card. You don't, you actually don't even need to carry your checkbook if you if you use checks. Um, you don't need to carry your insurance cards unless you are going to the doctor that day. And I do want to make a point, if you've ever heard other experts talking about um, your data is out there, so why bother? Um, there, that is true to a point. With the state of data breaches, there really is a lot of data out there about you. And chances are things like your social security number have been compromised in a previous breach. But that is not a reason to kind of throw your hands up and go, well, it's already out there. Because not every bad actor, every thief has every piece of data about you. So don't make it easy for them. And identity theft is often a crime of opportunity. So things like a lost wallet, um, the less that's in it when it's lost, you know, the less damage that a bad actor could do if they pick it up. Hopefully it'll be a good Samaritan and they'll just send it back to you, but you never know, um, you know, whose hands it's going to fall into. And I'll just, I'll close this with, um, look, what can I do right now? Okay, Eva, you've got me either, either I've got you fired up or now you've got me really scared and nervous with all of this information. What can I do right now? If you haven't done it recently or you've never done it, please review your credit reports. It's, it's free to do. You can do it at annualcreditreport.com. I know that sounds weird. It's a .com, but that is the appropriate website that's set up. It's free by law. And if you need help reviewing them, well, certainly you can reach out to us. There's a lot of re free resources out there. Um, of course, Identity Theft Resource Center, there's the Federal Trade Commission, and there are paid services. There are paid identity protection services, and we have information on how to do your homework if that's something that you want to do. It's uh, certainly not uh, affordable for everyone. Not everybody can pay a, a company to do this work for them. Um, they do take some of the legwork out of it and they, they have a legitimate use, but you don't need to feel like you can't protect yourself if you're not paying for those services. There are things that you can do yourself and there's plenty of free help out there. So with that, um, Andy, I hope I didn't step too much on your time. <laughs> <laughs> Eva, thank you so much for an amazing presentation. Um, it's so interesting how fraudsters are becoming increasingly methodical and they're deploying these tactics that really connect with our emotional state given yes. the space that we're in right now. And I like how, <clears throat> excuse me, you talked about avoiding the scam. I know one thing that I do personally is I block, oh, excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> oh my goodness i know i have a dry throat from talking too i 
I'm having all kinds of technical difficulties tonight. Ooh. But I like how um, in avoiding the scams, ooh, excuse me. <clears throat> Personally, I um, block calls that, oh, excuse me, I block calls that aren't programmed in my phone. So it allows me the opportunity to be able to mitigate fraud. And because I'm having another technical difficulty, I'm going to pass it over to you, Andy, and I should be good for the Q&A. <laughs> Okay, sounds good. Hope you get that that frog out of there, Camille. And and I'll and I'll tell you the thing I love about Eva's presentation is it, she really talks a lot about how to protect yourself. And and I think that's the most important thing that uh, we can take away from this. I'm going to talk a little, you know, quite a bit about that too, because at the end of the day, you know, the bank or whomever is not going to be, you know, your greatest advocate. You're going to be your greatest advocate. You're going to be able to take the steps to be able to uh, to stop this, and uh, and quite frankly, the consumer, uh, such from the bank point of view right now, is the the, the biggest uh, or or the weakest link in the chain, so to speak. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But, uh, but Camille, you talked a little bit about you know the, the that peas theme. I love that because you you didn't even know this, but within fraud and claims management with Wells Fargo, I am in the prevention and partnership department. I'm really, really with you on the whole peace thing. All right, I'm, I'm right there with you. But every day I get to see the, you know, we all get to see the, the ugly underbelly of crime. And I can tell you that I work with a great group at Wells Fargo who every day are working to advocate for the customer and and to make sure that uh, that we're protecting our customers from from these guys that are out there just just trying to defraud you every day um and and honestly today i'm on the heels once again this is my third time of cleaning up a fraud event that happened to my elderly father All right he's already been the subject of of two of those grandparent schemes that he was talking about and uh, and just about a week ago he spent a couple of very good quality hours with a guy from PayPal, <laughs> who was trying to help him with a transaction, apparently. Um, anyway, it, it's just a mess. Um, when, you, especially with elders, uh, they, they just don't understand what's happening, and, and they trust seems like everybody. So, anyway, really, really tough. But, uh, but nonetheless, uh, these fraud actor actors, they've learned a lot over time. They're becoming more sophisticated. I mean, I'm old enough uh, as a banker to remember the the biggest things we had to worry about were. You know whether there was a counterfeited check or maybe some counterfeit payment cards, and and a lot of counterfeit card risk was mitigated with the advent of chips with debit and credit cards. Uh, though there's still some outliers uh, of merchants using that, that mag stripe, which is 1950s technology. But then but then so is the the checks checks um, in the bank side. We see a lot of counterfeit checks, and so rather than ending the use of checks which i hope happens at some point and it's going that direction uh we continue to try to put counterfeit detection technology in place to be able to determine whether or not a check is good uh it, it's not going to work forever but we're, we're taking actions like that but nonetheless it's more sophisticated the actors are more sophisticated the fraud itself is more sophisticated uh you know i, I think about fraudsters uh, where you know, it's not it's not just some teenage boy in his bedroom using stolen cars to buy games and, and the value of the games online, though it is that. But it but it's all I mean, think about uh, fraud organizations as being like these huge global conglomerates uh, They're They have call centers that are the size of warehouses and they're in poor countries with local management teams and success metrics and performance measures about how much they could actually steal. And and if you were in a poor country and. and uh, couldn't make a living any other way, what would you do? I mean, where, where would your priorities be? And so it's, it's really, really important to understand that this is not small time stuff. But as bankers, we worry about, you know, the state sponsored fraud cells, domestic fraud cells, local gang networks, teenage and that teenage boy I mentioned a minute ago. But here's the other part of it, of the issue right now is that, you know, con consumers, we all, we all demand money at a faster pace, right? We want spending to be easy. Uh, rightfully so, we want the convenience of cash without necessarily having the cash in our wallet. And as a matter of fact, I saw a stat, stat from, I think it was one of the credit cards, that the use of cash has just plummeted. And of course, that happened with uh, with COVID as well. 
but uh, but I love money movement, uh, money movement, uh, you know, P2P products like Zelle, like Venmo, like Apple Pay. I, I love their features. I like to be able to go to a store or online, not have to worry about my wallet. I love the preloaded cards. I love all that stuff. And uh, but, but even with those you know, conveniences, what's happened is that they've been built with a consumer mind. Move money fast, move money easy. And so the new fraud controls, they have deployed at a slower stride, I hate to admit they have, than the money movement innovations themselves, right? So as a result, you know, banks sometimes have to ca catch up with the fraud actors rather than be ahead of them. And honestly, when fraud actors have 24 hours a day to find their weaknesses and they don't have any regulatory burdens to be able to follow, uh, they, they have the, the upper hand. And, and so, even if the weaknesses aren't uh, at, even at the bank. So let's let's go to the uh, the next page. I want to you know, and some of this is going to be you know um, duplicative of what we heard from Eva. She Eva said, has such a thorough presentation, but I, I will say that some of the data that we're seeing out of um, the industry, you know, for for this last year, uh, impersonation scams were the top dog, and you know, scammer contacts customers via email or phone or text, and then claiming to be from the government, you even talked about that, I don't have to re reiterate it, but yeah, COVID was just a, a whole different ball game. And in many ways, we bankers, we were kind of, well, as taxpayers, we bankers weren't happy, but as bankers, we bankers were happy because we all made our numbers last year. And the reason for it is because the fraud actors were heading down the path of defrauding the government instead of defrauding the banks. And so we actually got a little bit of a reprieve, which which I thought was was kind of interesting. But purchase scams, yeah, we all remember the, the great 2020 toilet paper chase and the N95 mask shortages. Uh, everything was in short supply. And of course, fraudsters were happy to take their money, uh, take your money uh, during during the, the, the uh, trying times in the midst of the quarantine. But see, here's the thing, and, and even talked about urgency. Anytime we have an, a national emergency, it could be a hurricane, tornadoes, earthquakes, whatever it is, um, there's going to be these kind of scams that pop up. And so as a consumer, we have to make sure that we're being wary of that and know when the calls start picking up and they're going to be related to that, uh, that you know, emergency, we're going to find that, that's case, that, that to be the case. Uh, account takeover, 22% of all scams. We see this every single day. It's just, it's just, uh, it's, it's unreal. And, and a lot of this uh, comes from uh, situations where a fraud actor has gotten your information, they use a spoofed phone, so it looks like they're calling from, let's say Bank of America uh, or Wells Fargo, and it's not Wells Fargo. And so you, you, you have to really be careful about, you know, trusting who it is that's calling you. But uh, they'll they'll actually ask you for information, and, and uh, a lot of times what happens is that the consumers will give it to them, trusting who they, they believe is actually calling them. Um, the the investment scams last year, it's it's basically your employment scams and Ponzi schemes. Um, you know, very unrealistic opportunities. We we saw that as well, uh, not just broadly, but you know, I know that our bank did as well. But the romance scams, uh, you know, the romantic interest online, no matter what that situation might be. Uh, you know, but that th those are the top, you know, winners, so to speak, for this last year. And, and here's the thing is that when it comes to scams, um, there's really not a lot of protection for the consumer. Uh, when you think about your credit card being used, your debit card being used or your account being used in a certain way, you're, you're generally protected by regulations from the bank. But when it comes to you being duped and a, a consumer there's not a lot of consumer protection right now. I'm starting to see that shift a little bit with the CFPB, but it is something that uh, you have to understand and, and why it's so important to protect yourself. Um, the, the process flow I have on the right there is a pretty typical process flow. Uh, you have to uh, you know, know above all the information is powerful for fraud actors, information is king. And then the more they know about you, the more effective criminals they are. And so uh, as Eva said, this is the scary part, they already had your information. I mean, they probably had your information like 50 different times uh, and, and because it's been stolen that many times from various companies. You always hear about these data breaches. Well, your data is out there. Maybe it's refreshed, but they've got it. And so the only thing you can do, again, is protect yourself. So then the question is, okay, well, how do I do that? Eva covered a lot of, the, a lot of these things, but I like to put it in this really, you know, concise format that, that I can understand and something that, you know, plays 
with with the words it, you know, it has kind of wordplay so you can kind of maybe remember some of these things as well so let's go to that last page and and to take a look at what those uh, those things are and they and they go to what we see every day in the banking side too so let me just say this i'll start with this first one which is hey don't call me i'll call you if there was one thing i could talk to the entire country about if they put me on national television i would say stop sharing your passwords or your one-time passwords with people who call you because you know eva talked about how strong multi-factor authentication is well it's not if you just give it away right so don't you know so consumers nationwide please don't give your one-time passwords away and again just be careful about who who's calling you now the second one is wait don't push that button uh, email links are the most common methods for extracting information from scams, and we we also see a lot of that uh, these days. What what happened to the the pipeline recently? With uh, you know, there there basically larceny going on where you've got uh, you know a, a company out there. Some probably pushed the button in the past, and so they've got uh, you know some, uh, uh, some some real problems on their computer. But but if an e email interests you, to to Eva's point, just get out there. If you're not sophisticated, if you don't understand URLs very well, just don't ever push the link. Uh, don't push that button. The next one is run faster than the bear. Uh, fraud actors dream up new MOs through different cyber malware, et cetera. And, and tech companies will release new security updates to defeat it quickly, but you gotta keep your updates current. Again, run faster than those bears. And then bring out your creative side. Um, you know, use, use passwords like you know phrases or interlinked numbers. So you know, my dog had 56 puppies, exclamation mark. You know, I mean, it, whatever, whatever you can remember, but it's got to be a lot of, lot of digits, and, and I know it's hard to do that, especially with so many password requirements. Um, I think, I think even last time you and I spoke together, you would, you had talked a little bit about putting, putting the passwords on paper. I was like, okay, that's a good idea. <laughs> Don't put them on your computer. That's a good idea. <laughs> I did I said a lot of folks? It's gotten to the point now where people say, uh, I can't remember all of the passwords and and a password manager is not intuitive for me. I, I don't know how I'm going to do that. And so even though you will hear lots of people say never write down your passwords, the reality is if you're going to write them down on a piece of paper, not on your computer, not on your phone, not on any nothing digital, on a piece of paper and you keep that secured, you actually are much better off having that piece of paper with your complex, unique passwords than just using the same easy passwords. Isn't, isn't it wild in the digital age that uh, in this case, probably the best uh, fraud mitigation is this and this. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah. it, it, it's just such an irony. Um, so uh, the next one is closely linked to the first one, which is verify but don't trust. Uh, literally go into uh, the app store today and you can download an app that turns your caller ID into whatever it is you want to say. It's just that easy. Three three dollars and forty nine cents, and and you are you are Wells Fargo Bank of America. Fool your friends, the app says. Fool your friends, uh huh. Never trust, never trust caller ID. Never trust caller ID. Um, stop, freeze. I, I can tell you that when my father got uh, scammed the first time, I went in immediately and took a, a Eva's advice. Uh, there's four bureaus that you need to go out and hit, and they're ones that you already know about for the most part, which is Equifax, Experian, uh, TransUnion, but the one that people don't always know about is Innovus or Novus. And make sure you put those freezes on all four. Don't be afraid to. It's easy to take off. It doesn't cost anything. It's easy to put on. And 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 also, I encourage people to do the same thing for their kids. Right. And there is a way to be able to, to have those children protected as well. And you do want to have your children protected uh, and ensure that their bureaus are frozen. And uh, and so there's ways to be able to do that on the, those uh, websites as well, literally on the bureau's websites. The next one is you must not act now. And that's really advice to all of us. Slow down the game. Don't let somebody press you into moving quickly or one time related offers. And, and if you feel uncomfortable, just slow it down, verify it, outsmart the fraudster's process. Um, next one's bet with chips. Again, this kind of goes back to the cards that we have in our wallets. 
mag stripe died a long time ago it's just that it hasn't been taken off the cards yet and the reason for that for the most part is that because the petroleum industry those gas pumps that you use every day there's still a, a great number of those because they their, their deadline for converting to the chip technology was delayed and delayed and delayed it's actually happening now but uh, there's a lot of those mag stripes out there the skimmers get a hold of those mag stripes and you think well what can they do with that they can purchase online right and so they skim they take a picture of your your you know in some cases password if it's a uh, if it's a debit card and then they'll go out and use that information online so when you can you can't always but try to pick that gas station or that you know try not to use that that mag strip I, I always try to avoid it myself if i can um next one is uh, feel lonely get a dog uh it, this is not meant to be light-hearted too much because there there is this issue of loneliness loneliness is really really real and people who are susceptible to you know romance scams and, and friendly fraud and elder abuse uh they, they are just so susceptible to this and so i actually encourage people reach out to people who are lonely. If you know they're lonely, be a friend, you know, and, and, and befriend these folks because that human touch has a lot of value. And then we can, we can all do our part as humans by really um, preventing loneliness such that we can. We, and especially COVID was horrible for people, right? But we're, we're getting through that rut. Um, the last one is, is know the game. And this is just simply, you know, it's what we're doing today. It's, it's being educated, educating yourself on on what is going on with fraud every bank has a website now to to our, to our guilt uh, it, it's generally on a really big web page it's full of marketing material and you have to go find it these security pages but they generally are kept very current with the latest of what's going on with uh, uh, you know fraud and, and, and scams and so forth Eve has got this beautiful website that I, I, I go and learn from every day and it, it, it is a is a great thing to make sure you're keeping up with it and she cross references i don't have to go all over the place educate yourself because an educated customer is their own best friend and knowing fraud methods can help you avoid uh, the fraud and not be a victim right so my my presentation is real short that that's really it i just you know because because eve is so good at this i just like to make sure that people know there's a banker out there talking too but <laughs> but let me just trust me when i say consumers and banks and the government are losing billions. I, I fear that with all these different government programs uh, for stimulus, we're, we're gonna be staring down a really, really scary, scary total between PPP and the economic in, impact payments and the unemployment payments. You start adding those things up, folks, we're gonna be thinking about a number that starts with T. I want you to yeah, think about that gonna, for a we're second. We're gonna approach a trillion dollars. Yeah, it, it is it is unreal how much money these these guys are taking. And and uh, it's because we have let our guard down and we haven't protected ourselves and the government hasn't necessarily protected the, the consumer either. And uh, and we've all got to get better. But the bottom line for me is we all have to play together. This is not a, an army of one. We all have to be able to play our part. But the, the thing I would implore is protect yourself protect yourself that is that is the best thing that you can do for for uh, for yourself and also for these other entities that have been mentioned so that that's all i have today and, and camille i'll uh, i'll pass it back over to you well thank you so much andy and eva and yes the frog stir is back i got that tickle out of my throat <laughs> <laughs> nice <laughs> so thank you so much for your prevention and your partnership I love number one, um, don't call me, I'll call you. And um, Eva, you made a point earlier when you stated that your password should be singular to the platform that you're using it for. And I have to say this to our participants. Um, those of you who are using the same password that you may very well be using for your Netflix and your Hulu and your Amazon, and you might be sharing them with friends and family because one thing that we've all done during the pandemic is Netflix and chill. But if that password is the same on those sites that you're using for your credit applications and you've shared them with friends and family, that's not good. And then another um, that I love is number five, verify and don't trust. How many of you are receiving those telephone calls about a warranty that you have on a car that you do or don't have. 
Um, so I was mentioning earlier before the um, frog took over is that uh, for me, in order to avoid the scams, I block calls on my phone. So if it's not a programmed contact, it goes, it gets the do not disturb and goes straight to voicemail. So that has definitely helped me. And then number six, stop freeze. So putting a freeze on your credit bureau um, is important for both you as well as your family. Um, but you'll also find that most of the credit card companies that you have relationships with will provide you, um, to Eva's point, making sure that you're reviewing your credit report on an annual basis and, and really now at this point on a biannual basis. Um, but those um, opportunities afford you the opportunity to look at it monthly. Um, so it is a complimentary service, which most of the credit card companies do offer. And um, Eva, I do have a question for you. What okay. are your thoughts relative to the radio frequency identification wallets? Um, so those RFID wallets that um, I know a lot of the, um, you know, the, the men and older generation kind of gravitate to. What are your thoughts regarding those? Well, look, they certainly can't hurt. Um, it, it's true that RFID is the the, da the information and the data on those chips can be captured by scanners and they're used in supply chain production. But I also think that if you are looking at how many risks that you need to monitor for yourself, that is one that the chances are very slim that someone is going to be able to use an RFID scanner to get data off of your card. They'd have to virtually be on top of you. Could it happen? Yes, but they really have to bump into you. The notion that you can just walk over an archway or through, you know, into a building or whatever, and it's all equipped, it, they really don't work that way. So, I mean, if you're paying for the wallet because you like it and you think, well, that's just kind of one extra layer of protection, or maybe you're traveling and you are going to be bumping into people left and right, um, then then I say I say go for it. But if it's if it's on the top of your list of things to be concerned about, I would move it down a few notches. Andy, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, yeah, I think it's a great answer. Um, I actually have one. And the great irony is I, I got it from my dad. <laughs> so anyway, he, he needs one too, I guess. But uh, yeah, um, yeah, the, the odds are not in the favor of the bad guys. It's not really your biggest threat um, mm -hmm. at all, but it, it, it's, you know, the threat, as small as it is, does sell a lot of wallets. And again, if Thank you, you like how the wallet looks and they're functional, then, then I say go for it. It certainly isn't, isn't harmful. Yep. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, and of course, the, the tense tip that um, Andy provided, know the game. Um, don't lose yourself in the fraudster's game. And I think when we talked about the common scams, um, a lot of those deploying tactics connect with your emotional state. So definitely, you know, when you get those types of emails, really lead with your head um, and not with your heart because they're definitely pulling on your heartstrings. Um, so I can't thank you enough for the prevention and the partnership. And um, as I said earlier, I always have the um, honor of presenting to the National Council of Negro Women and the National Council or the National Coalition of 100 Black Women. But to be able to share in this partnership with them tonight um, is such a great experience. And I apologize for all the technical difficulties. And um, we can Neil? identify yes you do have a yeah. question we do have a, a few rapid fire questions if they uh would like to take them sure yeah, please by all means first question out there is how secure is using a password manager uh depending on the password manager they they can be very valuable i would recommend that you do your homework and make sure that it's an actual legitimate company so look for the online reviews and, and those types of things. But if they're intuitive and you find them useful, um, that, that can be a great tool. Do you recommend changing passwords every three months or so? You want me to take that one, Andy, or you want to take it? No, go ahead, Eva. You're, you're in a roll. Um, so 
the that is that was good advice a while ago and you'll still see some folks saying it's better to to refresh and change your passwords on a on a regular basis actually the new advice is make them longer and complex and you don't need to change them as frequently because what we were seeing behaviorally if people change them too frequently they can't remember so they start making them easy and that mm -hmm. defeats the whole purpose so you should absolutely change your password if you are aware of a compromise. If you get a data breach notification, you see something on the news, oh, you know, this XYZ, my email company was compromised, anything like that, you should absolutely change your password at that moment when you become aware that there's a potential for compromise. But as far as changing it really frequently, that is less necessary than having a unique and, and more uh, longer password. Yeah, I, I'd uh, I concur with that. I'd also say that when you do develop your password, we talk about longer passwords and more complex passwords. Uh, it shouldn't include the name of the business that uh, you're actually signing into, what, such as the name of your bank and so forth. Don't don't put the bank name. I mean, there, there there are certain things that the the fraudsters will guess. That's intuitively one of those things. Uh, some some banks are now and some companies are now prohibiting you from doing that because they're reading to see if their if their bank name is actually in your password. So. I, I know that's probably you know, maybe intuitive for some, but whatever that that is, vary it. Make sure they're a sophisticated vary it, which which may mean you know either the password manager or you know the, the pen and paper that Eva mentioned earlier. Okay, some banks are. How are banks helping with seniors who are getting a large amount of gift cards? That are purchasing a lot of amount of gift cards. Yeah, um, I, I can tell you that. Uh, that from the we call it elder financial abuse and uh it's it's a it's an it's an ongoing but also a growing problem both with the population of the u.s growing older uh, and then also as it grows older they seem to be more susceptible and there's a lot of a lot of folks that a lot of friendly fraud and, and care or caregiver fraud as well uh mm -hmm. what the uh, the banks are doing is monitoring transactions and uh, and there's a couple of things i know i'm working on right now which is making sure that when we have sort of a, a live event happening, either at our call centers or in our our, uh, our our branches, making sure that there's also a live fraud investigator, you know, available for that person at the same time. Uh, we've more looked at that in arrears before, but now we're we're certainly moving towards where we can respond much more quickly, and uh, and hopefully stave off some of those issues. But the the main thing though is we have rules. Uh, when it comes to looking at fraud, uh, even mentioned, you know, the idea of us capturing data. We use data all the time. So the idea that you have data, you have strange transactions that are outside the pattern of spend or velocity, you add the age to that, and you add a potential report of a situation in a branch in a call center. Now you get this pretty good full story that there's something going on, and that helps us protect the uh, consumer in the end. Well, and I just want to add to that that, you know, it's not just the banks. The banks have a responsibility, but so do the retailers that are selling the cards. They have a responsibility, but we all do. I think when you see something, you can intervene. And the reason that I say this is one of our victim advisors, one of our advocates happened to be out shopping at a Target of all places and um, noticed this this somewhat frazzled elderly lady trying to purchase a, a huge number of gift cards and the cashier was going wow do you have a party happening what's what's happening here and and uh he stepped in and said because she was so frazzled are you know are you okay oh i'm scared i'm gonna get arrested and i've got to pay this and he's like whoa 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 so he took the time to just have a conversation with her we stopped it we stopped it she listened because here was someone that was saying, oh, actually, here's my card. I work in this space. So while we don't want to reduce the autonomy of our senior citizens by telling them what they can purchase, when and why, it's okay to ask friendly questions, especially when someone looks like they're in distress, which this person clearly was. And I think it takes all of us, not, not just the institutions, but us as a society too. Well, that's a, and that's a great ad, Eva, because I will tell you that, um... The banks don't necessarily, let's say it's a big box store, we don't know there's gift cards being purchased. We don't get that information in our uh, authorization systems. And so 
Now we can guess if we see, you know, large odd amount or even amounts with what look like maybe a typical service charge, we can guess. But because we don't get that information, we're really depending a lot on the retailers. How do I know if I'm giving too much information to an inquiring company? Well, that's a good question. I think it depends on who who started the inquiry. <laughs> Did you initiate the inquiry? I mean, if you're going to apply for a loan, um, then you do have to give out a lot of information. But if you're the one that engaged, you did your homework and said, this is, I'm going to this credit union or I want this particular credit card, you have to provide that information. If someone else initiated the contact, then the, you have to ask yourself the question, why do you need this information about me? What, what is this about? And more often than not, it's going to be, they're not going to be able to give you a good answer. So I would say, instead of thinking about, am I giving too much information to the company? Think about who started this conversation. And if it was you, and you know you're dealing with a legitimate company, um, you do have to give your identity credentials to them because they, they do have to authenticate you. If it was someone else that started it, giving them any information is too information. You just you just say, okay, I'm gonna go back to the source. And then you initiate the conversation with the known source. Um, there's national reporting news indicating that radio frequency waves are receiving data from legislative buildings. When should you sus when should one suspect there's a problem anywhere? with this method of thievery. Good God. I'm sorry, can you reread that question, please? Certainly. There's a national reporting news indicating that radio frequency waves are receiving data from legislative buildings. When should one suspect that there's a problem anywhere with this new method of thievery? I'd have to look into that. I'm not aware of that news coverage, but I'd be happy to if the, um, the, the questioner wants to leave their email. Andy, are you, do you have a response for that? No, I'm, I'm not familiar with that unless the reference is the RFID that's used for entering the building or something. I, I don't know, but I haven't heard that myself. Uh, I've been getting a lot of email about warranty for my car. I don't respond to the email, but they keep coming. What should I do? Uh, well, well, clearly responding. you need to buy the warranty, right? <laughs> <laughs> I've gotten like four calls just today. I don't know what it is with the, the car warranty stuff right now. If it's the supply chain issues with the manufacturers, I don't know why it's taken an uptick. It's been around for a long time. Um, I, I think you have to look at it as a nuisance and um, just you know, go ahead and throw it in your junk mail. Maybe if you can increase your the strength of your spam filters on your email, if that's something that um, you have the, the knowledge and the skill and the ability to do. Otherwise, it's just one of those things that you you have to deal with the, the annoyance of it. Um, I would uh, recommend against hitting unsubscribe if those unsolicited emails have unsubscribe buttons, because I think you create more risk for yourself there. If it's a known entity that you did subscribe for communication from, that's one thing. But if these are things that you didn't even sign up for, I would be careful with that, and I would just just delete them. Yeah, and if they're uh, if they're phone calls, I mean, because that's where I get mine all the time. You know, the warranty's expiring. Uh, if you're not on the national do not, do not call list, I always recommend that. Uh, that doesn't necessarily stop the the fraudsters, but uh, don't, if it, don't yeah, but it, 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 yeah, I mean, I mean, it's like it's like the RFID wallet, right? It doesn't, it doesn't hurt. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, block the call, and then next time you get one, block the call again, and block the call again. I mean, it, it, it's a tough one to stop. Well, that's all the questions we have, and we'd like to thank you both for such an informative night. And we'd like to thank everyone who uh, stayed on this long and li listened to all the questions and got all this great information. If you're not a member of NCNW or uh, 100 Black Women, please think about joining. You can go to our websites anytime. And this entire uh, webinar will be on our NCNW website and our NCNW YouTube page in a couple of days. Thank you all. Camille, thank you for hosting. And I thank wish everyone can. a good night.
Thank you, everyone. It was really my pleasure yeah. to be here. It was a privilege. Thank you. Don't forget, reach out to ITRC if you need help. We're here to help you.